Hello and welcome to Magala Foresight. This is Mikhail Benasse, producer and host of the show. My guest today is Professor Tony Magania, medical doctor. He's professor in neurosurgery and head of neurosurgery and neuroscience at Magala University in Tigray. He studied Anglican theology for many years. He directs a neurosurgery residency and training program, as well as neuroscience research. A practicing Episcopalian who has done extensive religious and theological studies, he also reflects on their implications in his life. Professor Tony Magania, welcome to Magala Foresight. Thank you for having me. You lived and worked in Tigray for many years, and I understand you have a very special place for the people of Tigray. And in fact, you earned their respect, the respect of many people who came to know you and benefited from your services. Tell us how you came to establish your first contact in Tigray and your, ex your experience there. Well, I, I, this would have been my seventh year at Beckley University. I have been in Ethiopia since 2012. Uh, Meckley had some wonderful equipment. They had a very sophisticated MRI machine and a very large hospital referral area, but they had had problems starting neurosurgery. So I was recruited there by leaders of the university uh, who are also members of the TPLF. Uh, I toured it, we had a long discussion and they had a vision for developing the university as a center of learning and as a referral center for not only Tigray, but also for Amhara and, and much of Ethiopia. Even We even did training for surrounding countries. Um, so while I was there, we started, uh, we taught uh, medical students, we taught uh, doctors who graduated from medical school how to be neurosurgeons, we also started a training program uh, towards doing research in, uh, in, in neuroscience. And most of that related to a disease that happens frequently in Ethiopia called neurotubial defects. And this is where babies are born with spines and brains that aren't formed correctly, and they have to undergo corrective surgery. And we identified what the causes were. It got international recognition and before the war started, we were planning to do some interventions in prevention, which had to do with adding folic acid to salt. But uh, one of the problems we had was getting the Ethiopian national government to accept that it was a significant problem. But because of the war, all, the, all that's been put on hold. And I have to give credit that a lot of the work was supported by Reach Another Foundation which is an American and, uh, and, and Netherlands foundation, which helped us quite a lot. How extensive was this problem that you came to establish with this research? Right. And it wasn't just my research. We put together a team uh, from Meckley University. And in, worldwide, it's, it's like 0.5% to 0.1% of births. But in Tigray, there are many areas where it's 3%, which is, is the world's highest. And um, it, a lot of the babies die before they're born. And it was such that every day we were operating on one or two babies. But we can't cure them. They're still going to be left with some problems. But without surgery, they die. But it can be prevented if the women get enough folic acid before they get pregnant. So with, uh, you know, this effort, you know, to save as much as, as much as many as lives as possible, uh, you know, this problem is going to be really uh, uh, worse. So, uh, yes. And how do you think, how do you think this war will impact on the, well, you know, the aspect of the health of the, uh, the, well, the, the region? In a general sense, and I, I've written about this in my blog, we know that out of every thousand people, uh, studies were done in Ethiopia in the 1950s that 32 to 35 people died every year out of a thousand. At the time, at the height of our functioning at Meckley University and Eider Comprehensive 
specialized hospital, which is the teaching hospital and the, and the healthcare system in Tigray, that, that number, which is called the crude death rate, had been reduced from 32 per thousand to just six per thousand. So now you can estimate that it's gone back to 32 per thousand, which means just from not having health care, because there's really no health care at all in Tigray now, over 220,000 people will die this year. Women can't deliver babies correctly. People can't have simple operations. They can't have treatment for infections. They can't have treatment for cancer or diabetes. So, so it it's going. So it it's it's gone up uh, almost uh, more than four hundred uh, percent. So I think this is huge, and it is an indication that the cost of the war, that is. Uh, it's not only evident from those dying in the battlefield or through shelling, bombardment and other atrocities against civilians, but also from the toll that such diseases are taking. I mean, so you have the civilians that are killed either by combat, like the artillery barrages that happened in Mekali when there was nobody fighting them. You have, you have the intentional killings of males, and and then you have starvation, which right right now, uh, uh, right right now it's like two million that are at risk that are at severe risk of starvation, and then you have every year this two hundred and twenty thousand, so the numbers are as you said they're huge. Now to a related but slightly different point, in the ongoing war that has pitted the coalition forces, namely the federal government of Ethiopia, Eritrea, and the Amhara forces against the people of Tigray. Both sides have been proclaiming a just cause. You looked into more than a thousand years of history and theological tradition for both Christianity and Islam about what constitutes a just war, what in Latin lexicon is called jus ad bellum. Tell us uh, also, you also recently published analysis in which you saw historical and theological foundations support that the Tigray regional state is the righteous party. Why do you say that? Uh, please shed more light on your line of argument by taking the events and actions that led up to the war. All right. Well, Jews, Christians, and Muslims have pretty much an agreement on what we call a just war, a war that what a war that God would approve. There, there, and, and this, there were two main factors in the Christian religion, which are also recognized by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. One was Saint Augustine, who is an early North African uh, father of the church, and the other was Saint Thomas Aquinas, who was in Europe. But the concept was started by an African. And the, the idea of a just war is this. Number one, that it will save more lives than it will cost. Number two, that it has to be about saving lives. It cannot be about gaining property. Remember that the, the, the Amhara expansionists who are pushing Abi Ahmed say they want to regain Western Tigray. You cannot have a just war to regain territory. And just there are other ways that could be addressed if they had a claim like that than a war. Um, you, have to, you have to show mercy in how you fight. It has to be proportional. You can't use an atomic bomb or poison gas. Um, you, you have to... If the other side asks for a true ceasefire, meaning that they're going to stop fighting and promise not to attack again, which is not what the Ethiopian government said. They said they were going to do a halt to allow farming, but we know that they had taken all the seeds from the farmer and given the farming equipment to Eritrea. So that, that was a lie. So those are the, the basic things. And the Muslim 
uh, ideals and the Jewish ideals are very similar. There is in Christianity some who believe that there is no just war, that we should always be pacifists. Uh, so you have, but if you are going to fight, that that's the way it should be done. So the so the Tigray government uh, and the Tigray defense forces would be justified to 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 do that to protect their people. You know, but they'd have to follow the rules of war, treating POWs correctly, uh, taking care of civilians within their within their charge. Professor, uh, we will come to that shortly, uh, but one of the principles for justifying a, a just war is also the fact that the war must be a last resort when all the peaceful solutions have been tried and failed, such as negotiation. To what extent did Tigray try to pursue the peaceful avenue to avoid this war? Well, as you know, and it's now been well documented by Martin Plant and others. The, the, the war didn't start on November 4th uh, with the Northern Command incident. We, for example, at, at Meckley University, our budgets were being cut for months. Um, that the, the, we were having difficulty getting paid. They didn't wanna pay for the students. Meckley University was a university for all of all of Ethiopia, although it was mostly Tigray students, it was not all. They came from everywhere. Um, uh, we we were have they they normally the budget was increased by thirteen percent per year. They were cutting the budget, and this is for the second largest university in the system. Um, they also were building up forces in Lalibela and in Gondar. And they knew that Eritrea was building up forces. Uh, people were fearful that a war was going to start. I'm not an expert on what happened for November 4th. I leave that to, to the ghosts that were there to describe it. But there was clearly a buildup. And so I, my understanding is that this was an act to prevent further harm still falls in the justifiable. Uh, we, we do know because I saw it, that there were several attempts to take over the airport several times beforehand where troops landed and they were intercepted in the airport as well. How about the issue of proportionality? Clearly, the war was a, has been asymmetrical. Were the actions taken proportional so far? Yes. I mean, at, I mean the, the response was was proportional. It was a defensive action. Um, they only attacked those that were attacking them. And, and that's the same today. Um, and the territorial claim to Western Tigray, uh, constitutionally, the constitution hasn't been changed. That is still a part of Tigray. Um, and that's why the United States State Department and the Afri and the uh, and, and the United Nations statements have recognized that that was an unfair grab of territory. Uh, uh, what Ethiopia did that it could have been resolved by peaceful means. Look at it from the other side. Also, there was huge mobilization and coalition of forces of Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, plus uh, UAE drones. Even, even I can tell you that from a medical point of view, the Ethiopian government had recruited doctors and put them on station in Waldea and other places, anticipating that a war was coming. So mm -hmm. they, um, so there were many preparations. Uh, mo being a being a civilian, you know, I wasn't aware of that, but I've since learned about that and these these other things. So it, it qualifies as a defensive measure. And even now, international investigators and authorities have said that as well, have confirmed that. You wrote uh, in the article that the principle of a just war, in, in a principle of a just war, the good which is achieved by the war must be greater than the evil which led to the war. How are the two sides faring in that regard? Well, I mean, 
there's no doubt that genocide has occurred. We know that orders were given that it was okay to kill or maim male children. Uh, we know that orders were given that it was okay to rape and mutilate women. In When I was at Eider Hospital, we saw women mutilated. We saw they would bring rape victims in and the soldiers wanted the nurses to clean them up and then they would take them out. We saw that they did not treat POWs. Many times we took care, by the way, at Eider, we took care of both uh, of ear trans. We were the first ones to recognize their ear trans because the nurses recognized by accent, even though the federal government was refusing. They, they, you, a T grade can recognize an ear trans in a second. Plus, they don't speak Amhara, which everyone in the Ethiopian National Defense Force, you can't be in the Ethiopian National Defense Force and not speak Amharic. Um, we took care of Eritreans. We took care of, of Ethiopians. And we took care of everybody because that, that's what we're supposed to do. But many of them were taken out of the hospital. And I, I dare you to find any Ethiopian facility the only, the only, that, that took care of any Tigray. So when you say the rep victims were being taken away from the hospital by the soldiers after they were cleaned up, uh, where were they being taken and why do you think so? I mean, there's, there's Dr. Hayalem Kabedi, who is the director of research and the academic head of the College of Health Sciences. Uh, he's given witness on that on videotape, and he's discussed it with the African Union and the United Nations. But the Human Rights Commission doesn't want to hear. They haven't interviewed anybody about what happened, what we saw at Eider. But Why do you think they didn't want to listen? Well, I mean, the Human Rights Commission is appointed by the prime minister. I mean, they serve the purpose. They, they're not unbiased. And yet, a uh, few days later, or maybe a few weeks later, uh, this uh, head of the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission will be awarded uh, a prize here in Germany. Yes, I saw that. I, I think that's very disappointing. You know, I mean, you know, Abby got the Nobel Prize for Peace, and and it just empowers these people to it gives them permission to lie even more. So now let's move on to the Jews in Bela, the method of war, which you uh, earlier on tried to touch upon uh, slightly. So how is the war being fought? Well, I mean, and I, I I'm also a former soldier but not much. I, have, I was mostly a medical doctor in the American army, but I had some other brief experience as well. You know, army uh, fighting is a dirty business. War by definition, you're giving up the normal ways you behave. And war is emotional. There's no war where, where people don't do things they shouldn't. But the, what really makes what what makes a just war is where the leaders are instructing their men how to act, encouraging them that there are rules of war, rules of engagement, rules of conduct that you have to follow. What makes a war very unjust is when you have leaders like Esaias and, and Abby and people who are Abby's advisors like Prophetess Bertukin and Daniel Kibret telling them that Tigray are animals. They're evil. They're not humans. They have to be wiped from the earth. Uh, and you're telling the soldiers, do what you want. And you have the prime minister saying that rape isn't a bad thing, that they're trying to stab our soldiers with bayonets so it should mean nothing if our soldiers rape the Tigray women. When the leadership tells the soldier, when the common soldier 
gets that message, then they're tell then you know that hell is going to happen. Just like what's happening in unfortunately in Gondar right now, where where there's terrible things happening because there's no on 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 the Ethiopian side, and this is a reason why they're losing. They have no command authority. The Fano does what it wants. The Eritreans do what they want. The the and the Ethiopians do what they want. Nobody's in control. It's like they just come to a region and and say, "Have at it, boys. Do whatever you want. This is the way we're going to punish the region." This this was not a law enforcement op. This was not going to arrest somebody. This was going to punish, to wipe them out. Let me ask you about the massacre at Maikadra. Some of the victims of Maikadra who fled from there have been sheltered in the uh, internally displaced camps in Magala, and some of them were going to the Aydar hospital for treatment. From what you probably heard from witnesses from Maikadra, what is your understanding of what happened there? The Ethiopian Human Rights Commission had uh, issued during the early stages of the war a report accusing the Tigrayans of you know, massacring the Amhara, although some international media uh, reported, you know, contradict the, contradicting this, that in fact the Tigrayans were on the receiving end and that they were the victims. Uh, what do you make of uh, these, you know, conflicting reports? Well, I, I mean, obviously I haven't interviewed, I've seen some of the interviews. Uh, I think that that, that is a situation uh, where things were out of control. And we, I know that area because we had research sites there and I've been there before in, in peace times. It is an area near the Amhara border and it's part of this controversy, although it's mostly Tigray. And um, it, it looks like what happened there was that Amhara militia attacked Tigray first. And then uh, Tigray militia came upon the Amhara militia and what they did. And uh, they, they didn't have much discipline and they didn't take prisoners. They, they sort of took revenge out. Um, but the initial, our understanding is the initial insult, the initial act was the attack was the attack on on the uh, Tigray farmers that were there. And this has continued to now. In Western Tigray, uh, we still don't have good communication, but it's well documented that they have concentration camps in Umera, that they're th killing people and throwing them in the river, uh, even, even women, uh, that the goal is to eliminate the, the the Tigray presence in that region. So given what we know now about what the intent, especially of these Amhara militias was in Western Tigray, this was not any, that their intent was not to go there and do any type of liberation campaign. Their intent was to cleanse the area so that, so that Amhara farmers could be put in their place. So when we see it in that context and based upon the interviews that the UN has done uh, with the refugees in Sudan and those we saw in Mekali, I, I, you know, that's the story I think I believe. But the the leadership of the TPLF is, says it should be they're open to investigation. But that's the best guess of what happened. But the initial action was not what was not the Tigray taking out uh, uh, Amharic farmers. The speakers. The people who relate the story in Sudan speak to Grenier. The, you know, people, people have to understand that in the countryside, which I know very well, they don't, the Tigray don't speak Amharic. They, don't, they only speak to Grenier. Unless, you know, if they're Irobe, then they'll, they'll speak like Soho, which is another language, but they won't speak Amharic. How about the TDF, the Tigray Defense Forces? How have they been performing in terms of the Jews in Belo? The conduct of the war. Well, let's look at what their their mode of attack. For example, when 
when they I'm talking in general about the war. Yeah, yeah. In well, the... in, I'll give you some examples. I mean, they're trying to maintain civilian administration. They are they're they're trying they're telling people to continue their lives as long as they don't fight, as long as they don't take action. Um, they their method of they lay siege to cities. They don't level the city. They don't they don't generally, as far as I know, don't barrage the city like what happened to Mechley when there wasn't any fighters there. These are the type, this is the type of behavior that you that you would expect. You know, the, there are laws of war uh, under United Nations Charter, and I know them as a former soldier, where once you take over a region, you're responsible to feed them. You're responsible to maintain security. You're, uh, you assume the civil administration. And what the, what the Ethiopia did, they, they just began starving people. They stopped their medicines. They stopped our health care. They stopped our communication. They shot people who went walking out at night. Uh, I don't think that ENDF ever took any, I don't know of any prison camp uh, I think they killed most of their prisoners. And they killed a lot of people even just presuming they were fighting. Professor uh, Tony Magania, do you see any peaceful way out of this conflict? Well, I think there's three ways that this war can end. Uh, one is the Ethiopian economy, which I've been studying a lot about. It's it's almost broke. I mean, he's he's uh, he's got like 400 million left. And he needs one and a half million to do the normal things the government does for the rest of the year. So I think there's a, if the economy collapses and what it would take is an addis for there to be no more fuel, no more food for maybe that will force an end. The, the second way it could happen is a military victory, which, uh, it, you know, I'm, as Antonio Guterres, the UN secretary, said he doesn't think the TPLF can be defeated. And that's because they're much more organized, used to fighting. And they have the Oromia, who make up 30% of the country. Most of them are now sympathizing with the Oromia, uh, with the Oromia Liberation Army and their other groups. How long it's going to take for military victory, I, I can't say. The third way would the third way, which would be the ideal way, which is what the Bretzian has said they want, is peace. But up to this last minute, I believe Abiy Ahmed, the head of the Ethiopian government, has said he's never going to negotiate with somebody that he he calls a terrorist organization. Organization, even though leaders of the African Union have suggested that he not call them a terrorist organization and come to the table with them. So in, in, if Abby isn't willing to negotiate, then I expect the war will go on. Earlier on, he said that this is clearly a genocide. There are those uh, who argue that it is difficult to bring the genociders and the victims to a negotiating table. What do you say to that? Yes, well, there are some experts in international affairs um, who are well known in Africa who said that Abby is fearful that he's going to face justice in the inter International Criminal Court. Ethiopia is a signatory to the International Criminal Court. Um, it, and there is an argument that, that he or I don't think Esaias is a signatory, but there's an argument that that he could be brought before the court. And some people have said that he doesn't want to, that he's fighting it out because he, he doesn't, doesn't want that to happen. And the issue is, if, where would he go? Um, this, is, this is not like Mangusto. The United States arranged for Mangusto to leave the country to bring peace at the end of the Derg regime. I don't know where, where Abby could go. 
but you know that's above my pay grade this is all speculation but i mean there is he has met the criteria generally for being the head of a genocide and um i and uh, that's just become clear more and more the president of your country the usa and joe biden recently issued an executive order to sanction individuals and entities if they don't agree to a negotiated ceasefire and allow humanitarian access, among other things. What do you, uh, what's your take on this? I, I don't know. I mean, I think, I mean, the United States has tried to play neutral. You know, the problem with the United Nations and other countries is they always need to weigh human rights and self-determination with the sovereignty of a state. And the problem with most international action is sovereignty of the state stays first. Even, you know, you look in history, Germany, Rwanda, uh, and that, that's always a catch-all because nobody wants to overturn a country. But um, I think now that there's beginning to be a realization, such as Antonio Guterres said, that the Tigri are not going to be defeated, um, you know, may, maybe that will force things. So I think, I, I can't speak for the State Department. I'm an American citizen and I support what our elected government is doing there. Um, you know, I would hope that that and and also the TPLF, Dr. Debrecen has said that they're willing to cooperate. You know, we'll we'll just have to see what happens. I mean, I cannot for Ethiopia, for every Ethiopian, the best thing is to come to the peace table at, at this point. For everybody. But if they're not willing to, then there's and then I don't see what choice uh, Tigray has to protect her people. Professor Tony Magania, I have finished my questions, but if you have final thoughts to make, the floor is yours. Well, I think, you know, I'm, I'm a Ferenc, which for the English speakers means I'm a foreigner. Uh, sometimes it's used as a, a, a form of respect, sometimes not. Um, so I, I, I love Ethiopia and I love Tigray. I relate to it a lot. I have thousands of patients and, and many friends. I know the territory and I know the people. They are a good people. Even Ethiopians are basically a good people. They have good morals, they're religious people, they're good Muslims and Christians, Protestants and Orthodox and Jews. But uh, this is a bad situation and the best solution is to find justice and peace, to follow our principles that we learn about brotherhood and, and mercy and, and probably forgiveness. And uh, I, I hope that out of this, that, that some, there will be some joining and, uh, and of ideas uh, to, to get out of this. And I think the, the United States just has to represent the highest standards of what the world should be. It's not its job to fight or, or to, but the United States does have a right to who it gives money to or who it does business to. And its alliance has a right to do that. And, and if you, the, the treaty, for example, the, the, the African Opportunity and Growth Act, which, which gave the right of Ethiopian products to be brought in tax-free, was signed by both the United States and Ethiopia. One of the agreements was to follow, to be a just nation. And it's broken that. And it's not interfering with Ethiopian internal affairs. It's just enforcing, it's just enforcing a treaty that Ethiopia voluntarily signed. Thank you thank very you. much. And God, God bless Tigray and Ethiopia. Well, thank you, Professor Tony Magania, for this very revealing reflections and hopeful thoughts. And with that, we come to the end of the interview. Goodbye.